in this video we're going to be discussing the Roman army and the elements that made it such a powerful force in the ancient world. Now there's many aspects to Rome and we're going to be talking about each of those aspects but the power and dominance and significance of the Roman army simply cannot be underestimated. This is a military force, a, a, a style of military that dominated the world for roughly 700 years, if not a bit more. You could say as much as 800 or 900, depending on what you mean by dominant. Um, we're going to be going through some picture slides. These pictures are actually from a computer game that came out in 2004 called Rome Total War. Now, uh, while the technology is old, the visual representations, I think, will make it easier to understand the um, content that I'm about to discuss. Um, there will be a bit of what's called a user interface at the bottom of each picture. That will include a, a map and some numbers and pictures. Don't You don't need to worry about any of that. Don't let it confuse you. That's just part of the game interface, and that's going to be in the screenshots. Also keep in mind that the numbers of men you're going to see in these pictures are greatly scaled down. Because of the limitations of technology, it wasn't possible for the game engine to render as many men as there would really be in a full army. So in other words, where there would normally be a group of 480 men, there will only be a group of 80 men. It's, it's downscaled, but it, it's still proportionate to the way it actually would have been. All right, so let's get into those pictures. Before the Roman system of war came to dominance, the ancient world was instead dominated by the Greek phalanx and later the Macedonian phalanx. Now, a phalanx is, quite simply, a group of men standing shoulder to shoulder with shields and very long spears. The spear points are held forward horizontally to present a wall of spear points, like a forest of spear points to the enemy, and then further back, spears were held at angles to deflect arrows. There would be many more men in a real phalanx, and they would actually have enough spears to deflect arrows coming in. There'd be just it'd be like trying to, to throw a ball through a, a group of trees. It's just it's going to get caught in a branch. So right here is the old Greek style phalanx with shorter spears and large hoplon shields. Now these men would stand shoulder to shoulder, their so shields would overlap and protect each other and they would literally stand in a line and push the enemy off the field. Here we see the later style Macedonian phalanx. Now this phalanx had huge 20 foot sarissa pikes. These pikes, 20 feet long and these men are modeled to be about five feet tall, which would actually be the tip, about the typical height of a, uh, a Greek or Macedonian man uh, over 2,000 years ago. And uh, they emphasized smaller shields, but these incredibly long pikes, so that when held horizontally, five layers of spear points would be presented in the enemy's faces and they would just advance in that formation. So before Rome, this is what the typical uh, confrontation would look like at its core. You can see in the background we've got some city walls, we have cavalry skirmishing, uh, and our arrows flying back and forth. These ones are lit on fire. That was not always the case, but sometimes it was. But you can see here we have a Macedonian style phalanx going right up against a Greek style phalanx. And these banners are these banners are part of the game. They would not have banners that large. It just make it easier for the person to identify uh, which group of men belongs to which faction. And it came down to numbers, skill of the soldiers, and basically whoever got the better engagement here. Now, in this case, the Greek phalanxes would lose because they have shorter spears and the Macedonians just outnumber them and push them off the field. So this is pretty much how every ancient battle went for, uh, let's say, roughly less than a thousand years, but a long time. This is how battles were fought. The Roman system changed that completely. Threw it out the window. Instead, of the phalanx, the Romans emphasized heavy mobile infantry with l short swords, throwing spears, and large rectangular shields. 
in a still compact but looser formation. So this is how a typical Roman army would be arrayed when going into battle. Notice that they're deploying on a very flat plain. Uh, flat terrain was ideal for the Roman legion. Uh, each legion would be made up of maniples. Now maniples, are, you see these blocks of men. These are maniples. Each maniple would be 80 men. Then if you have eight of those, you have 480 men to form a cohort. And here we can see there's actually just a little bit more than eight. So this would be a full cohort. And then one cohort would form a part, a tenth of a legion. And each cohort would have supporting um, cavalry and other support troops. In that case, these are archers. The important thing to note in this picture is how the troops are arrayed. Notice the large gaps in between the maniples. This gave tactical flexibility, whereas the Greek system of the phalanx was a long line of men with spears held uh, horizontally and at angles. The Romans had nice gaps where their men could spread out, they could form a cohesive line, or they could maneuver they could change position to, um, to face incoming threats and face their shields wherever they needed to. So the advantage that this system had over the phalanx is just that, flexibility. They could outflank enemies, especially the phalanx, because the phalanx can only go in one direction, forward. In this earlier slide, you can see how large these pikes are. These pikes could not be turned. If you turned this formation, with these pikes lowered, they would become tangled and the phalanx would be ruined. They would have to be raised to a, hor a vertical position and then turn. Very slow, very clumsy. Romans, no such thing. Each man could easily turn, keep his shield up, and address any kind of threat. So, here in this picture, we can see an unfortunate group of Greek phalanx uh, getting completely surrounded. Now this was called outflanking. The Romans would use a fluid formation that would kind of widen and s swallow an enemy. And they would come up close with their shields, knock their enemy over with a shoulder bash, and then stab with the gladius, the short Spanish stabbing sword that every legionnaire was equipped with. And this phalanx, as you can see, is falling apart. Some of the men are already raising their spears because there's no room. There's no room to maneuver. The legionaries in the front are using their, so their shields to hold the spear points at bay, and the legionaries in the back are doing the killing. Um, this is probably the last bastion of, of a group of Greeks. And this actually happened at several battles, uh, most prominently the Battle of Kynos Kephali, which was in uh, moder around the town of Larissa in Greece, and the Roman legion proved tactically superior to the Greek phalanx, and re rendered the old style of war extinct. Flexibility was everything for the Roman legion, combined with discipline and high quality weapons and armor. We can see here a group of legionaries holding their shields, the front row is holding their shields vertically, while the legionaries in the back are holding them up at an angle to defend against incoming arrows. Meanwhile, the Roman archer auxiliaries you can see behind are firing a counter volley. Uh, Roman archers were not used extensively until later periods, but they were seen, especially in uh, northern Europe where many of the barbarians were recruited and they had very good archers. Notice how these legionaries in the front are holding their throwing spear, the pilum, at an angle where it can easily be raised to throw or can be used to ward off a charge. This is the kind of maneuver that the legionaries would be drilled in over and over and over again until it becomes second nature. Also note the excellent quality armor that each legionary was equipped with. This is called the Lora Segmenta, and it is made of heavy metal plates overlapping like the scales of a serpent's back. And this would be useful 
versus anything but the most direct of stabbing attacks or very powerful arrows. This made the Roman legionary uh, useful, flexible, uh, basically a jack of all trades. They could be deployed virtually anywhere. And with the Roman Empire being so vast, it was important that they had an army that could function well depend on a various uh, different kinds of battlegrounds. Here we can see a group of legionaries preparing to throw their pila. Uh, pilum, singular, pila, plural. These um, throwing spears had a um, soft iron tip that would bend on contact so that it would get stuck in shields and could not be thrown back. And here we can see some uh, Egyptian-style phalanxes approaching, and these phalanxes will probably be cut to shreds before they even approach because the pila will hit and break the cohesion of the phalanx. Now here we see another special maneuver that the each maniple would be capable of. This is called the testudo formation. In, in the case of going up against an enemy that has powerful and numerous archers and other projectiles, a legionary cohort, or rather each maniple, could compact itself into a tight formation called the testudo, which is Latin for tortoise. The tortoise would literally um, surround this group of men in their overlapping shields, forming a impenetrable box that would hold off all but the most determined of consistent arrow volleys. You can see how there's a gap between the front shields for them to see. That's basically all there was, and a small gap at the sides, and the greaves on the legs would protect um, the lower part of their body that the shield did not, and the helmet covers everything but the face and the ears. Um, a very complex formation to um, to assume quickly on the battlefield, but like I said, these legionaries during the early Roman period, uh, especially after the Marian reforms, which would be uh, from about 250 BC till about 200 or AD 200, would be able to assume complex formations like this and quickly. Finally. The Roman army utilized local resources in their army. These men that are close in this, in this uh, photograph are not legionaries. These are auxiliaries. Auxiliaries were local men that were recruited into the Roman legion. Um, they would serve for a time in exchange for Roman citizenship. And these men are support spearmen. Um, many of the tribesmen were familiar with fighting with spears, but you can see they're given good chainmail helmets, excuse me, good chainmail and helmets, shields. And back here we can see some cavalry, light cavalry. Uh, Romans, quote unquote, outsourced most of their cavalry to um, factions, uh, groups of people that were more proficient with them. The Romans were not known for having particularly good cavalry for various reasons. Um, these could be Numidians, they could be Germans, uh, but these auxiliaries would be well drilled and would support the core heavy infantry of the legions. And every legion would have a, a complement of auxiliaries. And here's another shot of the auxiliary cavalry. These would be charged spearmen here um, that would use this lance in a full charge but as you can see, the horse is not armored, their legs are not armored. These would be quick strike troops used to protect the flanks of the legions. In fact, if we go back several pictures, you can see how cavalry were traditionally placed on the flanks or the sides of the army to protect it from, um, from fast troops trying to get around the sides, including enemy cavalry. In the Roman army, flexibility was everything, and that included their command structure. Remember how each legion was made up of cohorts, and each cohort was made up of maniples? Every Roman army would have an overseeing general. He would usually be a consul appointed by the Senate to, um, to handle matters of state and war. Beneath him, each legion 
would have a commander. Each cohort would have a commander. And each maniple would have a centurion in charge of it. This meant that no matter where you were on the battlefield, there was already always an authority figure somewhere nearby to give orders and make tactical decisions. These men were very well drilled, experienced veterans who, would, who were picked especially for the attribute of staying calm in battle, keeping a clear head. This meant that even if the overall general was a subpar commander, the very structure and flexibility of the Roman army system, the legion, meant that they could win battles. For instance, at the Battle of Cynus Cephali, where uh, Philip of Macedon, uh, not, not Alexander's father, but a different king of, of, of Macedon, or Macedon, actually, uh, when he attempted to take over all of Greece, uh, the Romans came in, and an unknown centurion, we, history doesn't even remember his name, led 2,000 men, several, many maniples, behind the phalanx, and decided the battle. So it wasn't the commander, it was a decision made on the ground. Another sort of flexibility inside the Roman legion was the fact that it could be quickly make camp in a very structured way. They always made their camp the exact same way no matter where they were. They could quickly take it down and they could move at speed on the Roman system of highways. The Romans built excellent roads uh, for commerce but also for military purposes so that if there was a rebellion somewhere or some kind of threat to the empire the Roman army was never more than a few weeks away at, at the longest finally their policies of recruiting people from local populations with the promise of Roman citizenship for serving kept the Romans uh, the Roman legions in a good state as far as manpower goes so all those things combined kept the Roman army going a very long time and made it an incredibly proficient and dominant force in the ancient world. The one drawback was that the Roman army was expensive to maintain. The soldiers were fairly well paid, and their equipment was not cheap. It was well made, had good materials, and required good smiths to keep a steady pr supply going. When the empire stopped expanding, they stopped getting plunder from conquest, and civil wars started picking at the inside of the empire. That led to lower funds for the army, no land to give soldiers as reward for serving, because there's no, no new conquest, and the quality of arms and armor went down because they simply did not have the money to afford the kind of standards they'd had in previous centuries. Uh, and that led to the military system's decline. The fact that it was so expensive and required so much money and so much manpower to keep it going made that unless you were con uh, conquering new areas and getting lots of plunder and lots of expansion in a state of um, uh, maintenance, it was not a, a system that could stand up. It just simply too demanding. So there's my overview on the Roman army. We're going to be having a discussion board about the uh, what we've talked about here, as well as a quiz. So, I'll see you next time for our lesson on the Roman economic system.